everybody, and welcome to another Friday morning productivity mastermind with Mortgage Coach. Uh, as the two hosts of today's call, you've got myself and Jen DePlessis. What's up, Jen? Hey, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, remember, this is Mastermind, so all your questions, we're going to do our best to get answered. Whether you raise your hand and go to meeting or whether you post a question, your questions will get answered. And, and you're a big part of the value of this call. So hopefully you're not multitasking, you're engaged, and you're talking. We also have uh, Michelle Town, Michelle Town mentor and top producer and amazing mortgage coach leader. What's up, Michelle? Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Hey, happy Friday to you. So Michelle will be the boy. Well, both Jen and Michelle are in the trenches doing lots of volume. And again, this call is all about how do we make more money in less time. Uh, we also have Robert Stover with us. Uh, I hope everybody has watched the video that Robert did. I'm showing my screen right now. And we announced a winner to the referral magnet video contest. It was Dan Keller. And Robert Stover uh, did a great job. He was one of the key coaches or key judges at who won. So this video, it's number nine in the referral magnet playlist how to create a video that generates referrals. Robert went through and evaluated the top six videos, wrote up an analysis on what, you know, what was good, what could be better. And I, I would just say for anybody who wants to make more money in less time, you've got to watch that 18 minute conversation with Stover. So uh, he will be here to, to add value. But before we bring in Stover, um, we're gonna start off with Roberto Monaco. Roberto, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen and jump on jump on stage here with us. Oh, hi. What's up, my Good brother? Good morning, mortgage coach community. I am pumped to be here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, always, <laughs> it's always good to have you, my brother. I hope you can feel my energy. I, I hope you can, I can feel I can, it. I, I, can feel you, I, I can feel your energy, man. Oh, I love it. So, so here's what I have for you guys today. I, I've been doing video marketing since 2009. I haven't counted, but I would say around anywhere from 700 to 1,000 videos between the Facebook ones, the YouTube ones, and I have like three membership sites, private videos. So what I decided to do this morning, I woke up early and I wrote down the seven biggest lessons that I learned. I want to share them with you, and I hope that you maybe can take one lesson, incorporate into your business, into your practice, so that, yes, you can help more people, make more money, and experience more freedom. Lesson number uno, write this down, get a pen and paper. You have to focus on a core message. What happens is that sometimes you wanna record a video and you, and you have like two or three major points in one video, and now the more points you add to a video, the less effective the message becomes. So before you record a video, I was asked, what is the big idea here? What is the point that, I, Am I advancing here? What do I want my audience to believe and do in the end of my talk, the end of my video? When I say talk, presentation, video, in the context here, is all the same thing. I'm talking about presentation. So I always focus on one core message. And, and one example I can give you, let's say I want to throw you like five pens, right? If I throw at them, most likely you can, if you're really good, you can might get like all the five. But what happens now if I'm gonna throw you like 20 pens or 10 pens, I'm gonna be like, hold all of them. And you'd be like, man, it's impossible. Why? It's too many pens. Too many points. So lesson number one, when you have a video, make sure you have a, you're super clear in your, in your head. Because as an influencer, as a communicator, as a leader, if you're not clear about your point, your audience won't, won't be clear about your message. Number one. Numero dos, write this down. A structure creates freedom. I didn't say script. I said structure. Every great communicator, influencer, am I going too fast? No, no. you're good. Oh, good. You're good. So a structure is how you organize your videos. Now, obviously, okay, especially nowadays with Facebook Live, YouTube Live, there's so many different ways for you to get the message out. So many different ways. And what I learned in video marketing, there's not just like, okay, this is one way, or there's no such thing as the best way, because the best way for you 
might be different than someone else's best way. But what I found though, when you record these sales or marketing videos to generate business, overall, the, what I teach in a, in, a, in a video or in a webinar or in a talk, you always have five ma major points, your opening of your video, that something that's gonna break people's thinking pattern and make sure they you they focus on your message, you grab their attention. And I, I watched the review of uh, Robert. I love the review, Robert. By the way, you talk about grabbing the attention right on. That's step number one. Number two is always how you frame the message, and and how you position your message. People don't understand framing. Framing is like this. Let's say there's a party, and there's a thousand people dancing here, and there's nobody there. And then your buddy goes, "Hey man, can you take a picture of the party?" And be no problem. And then I take a picture of nothing. And there's a thousand people dancing here, and I take a picture of the wall. That is what bad framing. And framing is like, what do you want your audience to notice? So in, in a video context, because it's super fast, you always want to tell the benefit of watching the video in the beginning. In this video, you're about to discover blank. Now, the body or the, the overall message of the video, regardless on how it's licensed, comes down to one thing. Problem solution. Now, you can talk about problem, you can talk about the impact of the problem, the cause of the problem, the solution, how the solution works, why the, why the solution is the best alternative. But in the, regardless of how we frame, comes down to problem solution. Why? Let me share with you why. Because every time you communicate to speak on influence, your audience, either the consumer or the realtor, they fall under three categories. Number one, they don't know they have a problem, right? They really have no idea they have a problem. So you've got to educate them. Number two, they'll be like, I know I have a problem, but I don't have what? Enough urgency to change. So you've got to create urgency. And a very tiny percentage of the population, they know they have a problem, they have urgency, and they're proactively looking for solutions. It's very tiny, tiny percentage. That's why when you communicate, you always want to lead to the problem so that we educate the first level, you create urgency, and you hope that by framing your solution, you can move them during your call to action. All right? So we talk about opening, pre-frame, the body, problem, solution, and then you have what I call the pre-close and close. It's how to do a, a call to action in your video. Either they're going to call you, they're going to sign up for something, and I'm telling you, that should be your most exciting part of a presentation. Most of, of the professionals, they have no problem talking about the content, but when it comes to like giving a very specific, exciting call to action, they freeze. They don't like it. And should it be your, your favorite part, right? Because your message starts when your presentation ends. See, if you're doing a video, I mean, that is not the real... The, the, the real message of them, a real estate agent doing business with you or a consumer right, calling you, that is the, so the real message starts and the presentation ends. And the only way for you to do that, you have to be excited and super clear and certain about your call to action. So what I realized, what I learned is that structure creates freedom. So every presentation that I do, every little video, even if it is a 60 second video, to a two minute video, if I'm doing a training video, half an hour, whatever, if you're doing a TED talk, 18 minutes, okay? You always have a structure, that's point number two. Point number three, okay? Which when I, I didn't review the last segment of the videos, I reviewed the ones, Dave and I record a call maybe, I would say two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and something that most professions, and that is not, I'm not criticizing loan officers here. This is like overall because I work with the 36 industries, financial planners, technology people, dentists, you name it. Most people, they don't think in terms of stories. So the next communication, the next little video, I want you guys to storyify. That means that try it in your message try to, to come up like a very short story, very tiny, it can be at one minute in your message. And sometimes these stories, you wanna be able to tell the name of a client. Sometimes if you don't have permission, don't tell the name. And why is so critical 
for everybody to tell stories. There's a, there's actually there's a book. I, I don't recommend to buy the book unless you're gonna teach storytelling. It's called Story Proof. Uh, basically, this guy used to teach storytelling. He was teaching storytelling for NASA, and the chief engineering guy said, "What are you doing here?" And he said, "Well, I'm teaching storytelling." And this is NASA, right? The most logical people, engineers. He goes, "Storytelling works," and the guy said, "Of course, it works." And the engineer said, "Go prove it." So this guy went through a journey of years collecting every psychological research to put a book together. But what happens is that every time I, I try to lead with the facts and stats, people can counter argue them. They cannot counter argue your personal experience. That's number one. Number two, if your story is good enough, if your story is compelling enough, the people in your audience, the viewer, they're going to identify himself or herself, the character, and you're going to be so, oh, it's just like me. Oh, I, I, I totally get this experience that their filter of critical judgment, uh, the amount they're going to judge you decreases. So resistance goes down. So the more attachment they have with the character, the less resistance goes down. And storytelling doesn't have to be uh, a two-hour story or 20 minutes. You don't have time for it. But it can be like a 30-second or 40-second example. So always, and one of the key questions is like, that they want you guys to ask, as soon as you put a little outline in your video, the problem, the solution, you go ask this question, what is an example of that? Right? What is an example of that? Because that's a question that I always ask myself, so now I go, okay, man, this is the content, the training, so what is an example of that? And then I just find the story. Point number three. Point number four. Master the art of saying the same thing in a different way. I've been, I've been teaching public speaking presentation since I left Tony Robbins from 2002 to 2008. I was working with Tony Robbins, training and speakers, and then I opened up Influence Solid in 2008. So I've been doing this since 2002. My subject, communication, influence, public speaking, has been around, check it out, 300 years before Christ. Think about that. All right? First book, Aristotle, Rhetoric was written, you know, hundreds of years before Christ, before the Bible. So, and, and the subject rhetoric, they, call, they used to call rhetoric, has been taught, you know, for thousands of years. So how come I make a really cool living teaching that? Because I learned that I want to be able to talk about the same thing in a different way, with a different framing. And, and some, because sometimes loan officers goes or, or professional goes, oh man, whatever I want to say someone else, else is covering and what your clients want to know is about how you your perspective on the topic so I want to give a couple ideas for example you can record FAQ videos frequent ask questions videos you can talk about mistakes videos okay what's the mistakes that you've seen you can talk about lessons videos that's the one I'm doing today what's the biggest lessons you can record a SAQ videos right uh, FAQ is frequent ask questions videos SAQ is the should ask question videos, the videos that your clients should ask but they don't. You can record the list videos, you know, the three mistakes, the three ideas, four ideas, seven ideas if you're doing like a kind of like a series. Interview video, interview, uh, inter interviewee where someone interview you or interviewer when you interview someone, okay? You can talk about the secrets videos. What are some secrets in your business and behind the scenes? So basically, all these ideas, what they are, there are different ways for you to frame the message. Because it's not that what I learned, my, my experience, it's not like you record a video and everybody's going to watch it. It doesn't work like that. And what happens is that you've got to be able to talk about the same thing with a little twist. You change the angle, but overall, you always come back to the same theme. Now, if you're a loan officer, and it depends if you're recording this for realtors or consumers. For me, I want to. I work with leaders who want to use one too many communication to create, you know, to move masses of people. That's that's my expertise. So what I learned throughout my journey is that you gotta be able to. Because sometimes you go, man, I sound like a broken tape recorder. And when you do, you're doing a great job, you know. Because if you don't share a story, the marketplace will create one about you. So you gotta be able to tell a story. Uh, the, the fifth lesson I learned, okay? think in terms of series. 
And what happened when I, 2009, I started doing video marketing. And because I had a, a strong speaking background, at that time I done almost 3,000 talks, my first video was 20 minutes. And I'm like, man, it's hard to speak in two minutes. Super hard. And I really couldn't speak in like less than 10. Anything that, hi, my name is Roberto Monaco. 10 minutes, like 10 minutes? That's insane. I really didn't know how. But then I realized that public speaking, traditional public speaking and video market, they're, they're, they have some similarities, but a lot of differences. And one of the things is that in traditional public speaking, they are there. You have a captive audience, whatever, 10 minutes, 15, half an hour. They're not going to run away. In video marketing, they're just one click away. So what I, I, I learned, instead of giving, like, let's say, for example, three points in a video and make my video in 10 minutes, I decide to do a series of videos. So now I can hook the viewer. I frame, like, look, I'm going to talk about, in this series I mentioned, you want to talk about the five mistakes, the five lessons. But in that video, I just talk about one. And I create a series now. And I wish I did a study with a, I don't know the number, crack number. So I'm going to, I don't want to mention number, but it was like millions of videos. Wistia, the video host company. And they said the average viewing, uh, viewing time now used to be three minutes, now it's two minutes. So that's what's important. When I think in terms of series, I break it down my content. And that way, I'm assuring myself or doing the best I can so that the audience will watch my content. So instead of having three ideas or four ideas in one video, I might do four or three little videos, one idea each. I create a series. So I have a lot of series that I've I done. You know, overcoming fear series, how to close a talk series, how to use positive effectively series. So I record those series. Point number six, another lesson that I learned. Leverage your videos into other content. So we all want to, in the end of the day, is, is about positioning. I believe, and I feel like everybody has stories, everybody has lessons, and what I, I started doing this year, I published five books, they're 25 pages each, and I haven't, I, I love speaking, I love structure, I'm not very passionate about writing, that's not my thing, some people are, if you, that's your gift, amazing, I wish, I wish it was my, I love writing, I like to outline stuff and speak, so what I did, I developed this series, the Overcome the Fear series, the How to Close a Talk series, and basically they're like seven, eight videos. I upload them to a service called SpeechPad, SpeechPad, P-A-D.com. They charge me a dollar a minute. And now, just to give an idea, an hour of me talking comes back 25 pages Word document. And then you can find uh, people on Fiverr or Upwork. And then I have a, a copywriter. And she charged me around 400 bucks. She got, because I have an accent, and sometimes the translation service doesn't understand my beautiful accent, and I make some mistakes. <laughs> so she basically, she cleans up, and now I have really cool, I have like five ebooks, and I'm generating you know, leads online everywhere, on my website, Facebook campaign, and I haven't spent one minute writing. I literally just outline, the open, the preframe, the body, because record the video, YouTube it, Facebook, got it, transcribe, found a writer, and then it's cool. So think in terms of like, especially if you're doing a talk in real estate office, if you're doing, if you're gonna generate leads online, you know, as before you just start recording videos, take up the time to strategically think in terms of like, okay, I'm gonna talk about the seven mistakes home buyers make, okay? Right, so you've got these seven videos. Then you record them, upload, use, use on YouTube, email them, Facebook them, and then you transcribe them, speech pad, they charge a dollar per minute, so if you speak for half an hour, it's going to be 30 bucks. Then you find a writer, clean it up, a Fiverr, have a designer, and I'll have an ebook. And you can put in your, in your web, you can send for free to build up credibility. There's all kinds of things you can do. So think in terms of series has helped us a ton. So I hope that you incorporate that. That was great. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that was number six. And then the last one, which is very simple, is consistency uh, pays off, is how to be consistent. My thing is, I believe that in the end of the day, if I don't share my story, the marketplace will create one about me. 
And the worst thing that can happen is that when someone is looking for help, they don't know I exist. A lot of people think, man, I don't want to put myself out there, Roberto, because a lot of people, they have fear of judgment, of being judged, is real. So I, I, at one point in time, I stopped talking about fear of being judged, fear of making mistakes, and because, oh, man, people get it. But I'm telling you, people, a lot, some of you do, why right? you put yourself out there, but a lot of people, they, why they're not being consistent? And that has to do with uh, fear of making a mistake, for being judged. And for me, I change my mindset. And for me, the, right, here's my rule about being judged, okay? The ultimate judgment happens when someone that needs my help doesn't know I exist. And let me explain that. Think in terms of like a realtor who is struggling in your area or is really looking for a kick-ass loan officer, right, or mortgage advisor. Think about that. If that person doesn't never heard about you, in his or her mind, like, well, I never heard about so-and-so, therefore, that person is not that, what? Qualify or good, whatever. And the only reason for you to influence that judgment, because for me, not knowing that you exist is, some, is a form of judgment. I don't know. It's a form of judgment. And for me, the only way for me to influence that and change around and flip it is to make sure uh, I tell my story and I educate the person. So consistency when many, anything in life is very important. So that's what I had for today, 23 minutes. I hope you guys, uh, let me recap the seven rules here, okay? Uh, focus on your core message. It structure creates freedom, number of those. Storyfy your videos. Master the art of saying the same thing in different ways. Think in terms of series. Leverage your videos into other content. And consistency pays off. Roberto, Roberto, two more minutes. So first of all, awesome 23-minute presentation. Wow. Actually, you were 20 minutes. Um, I want everybody on this call, not only did he tell you how to create great videos, he showed you how to create two-minute stories that you can use at a Starbucks coffee shop meeting with a realtor to get more referrals, to have them understand how you help, how you deliver. So he helped you how to deliver a two-minute story at your next lunch and learn with realtors. So this is for videos. This is to help you make more money in less time by being more persuasive. So Roberta or, or Robert Stover, do you have any questions for, for Roberto before he goes or any comments? Yeah, a couple questions, Roberto. Um, I noticed in the, the video, one of my critique or my uh, critique columns was presentation skills. Yep. Um, how authoritative, how fluent um, that people came across. And in the videos, um, some of the people, some of it's just practice. They're not up in front of the video a lot. Um, but mm -hmm. others, there's a, um, it's almost like a mindset. They're like, oh, yep. you know, well, thanks for looking. Thanks for listening to me. And yep. um, how do people find their, their own personality and voice? I mean, they'll yep. have to be out there with flames coming out their head, right? Yep. Not everybody has to be Roberto. Um, yep. How do they find their personal authority and voice that people find interesting um, and get that confidence in their videos more? I love that. Yeah, so what happens is most people, they hate themselves on video. And I always ask, did you watch your – I have some people that last week and I had a seminar. It's like, man, I record a video. I never watch myself because they really hate themselves on camera. And I feel like in the big, if you people have the right expectation in the beginning, just expect the beginning is awkward. It is awkward. So expect that. Because if you people record one, two, three, four videos and feel awkward, like, man, I'm not made to be in front of a camera that stops. So the, the first tip would be just expect to be awkward in the beginning. Eventually, you're going to find your, how you find the true voice is, for me, this, I have a lot of energy when I'm speaking one-on-one. -on -one I'm the same guy. It's not like, oh, now I'm going to put a show. No, I'm, I'm the same guy. So the same guy that you are in my Starbucks presentation, obviously in video, you want to maybe raise your energy maybe 1%, 2%. But at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about authenticity. I know that's a cliche. But it's about being uh, super authentic and not changing much. I don't change between speaking or video or one-on-one -on -one hanging out. I'm the same guy. And I think speakers should not change, should not be like, Oh, now I'm going to act as if, which is the, the, the worst advice. You don't have to act as if. You just be. And that's the, the worst advice ever. So for me, 
I think that think in terms of like how you do in a one-on-one -on -one presentation and you make people feel special right? in a one-on-one, -on -one, especially uh, loan officers, they're really good at one-on-one -on -one realtors consumer. Just bring that uniqueness into the camera. And one tip is to, in the beginning, even for me, look, I've done thousands of talks before. In the beginning, I used to, where do I look? Uh, there's no feedback, it was awkward. I always think about one person. So I'm gonna talk to John. So I have, here we go, I'm gonna have a conversation with John, and then eventually I became more comfortable and, I, and then start having fun. So that would be my advice. As far as to become comfortable, don't try to change or put a hat on and just act as if and, and try to be someone else because that doesn't pay off, in my opinion. Talking about perfectionism, I, I, I talked to some of the people and stuff and there's a perfectionism. Um, what, what they don't realize is everybody that did these videos are yeah. just light years beyond the competitors now because they did the videos. Yeah. And they're going like, oh, well, this is wrong and that was wrong and this is wrong and, and it actually keeps them from getting out there. So talk about yes. that a little bit. Oh, I'll talk about that. So I done, I, I, in my career, I've done 4,500 talks, right? Lots of speaking. And I always ask this question, how many of you here came here expecting to be me being perfect this weekend? Nobody, nobody, 45 other talks, nobody raised their hand. Yeah. And I say, how many of you here came here expecting to learn a lot? Everybody raised their hand. So it's the whole, because people expect themselves, they're like, oh, I hope when they see myself, they're, they think I gotta be perfect. People don't, they don't expect you to be perfect, they expect to be awesome. They expect that you care enough and share why and here why TV you know reality shows are so popular why because it's so raw why right? it's raw and people if, if people don't appreciate be, uh, someone else being raw you know reality TV shows not be that popular they are because they're poor. yeah there's some acting some scripting and you can see it but for the most part the reason it became famous is because they are raw so the idea of look you're not gonna be perfect and another mistake too, Robert, uh, I feel people make is that they try to compare themselves with like a, a media person, celebrity, right. that has media training for 20 years. Oh, I'm not like that guy. Dude, you're not gonna be like that. Look, every single video, if you watch this replay, probably I made like 20 mistakes, you know, I did. And do I care? Really, I just wanna help. And that doesn't mean that I don't wanna improve, it's different. I'm always trying to elevate my game, but you just accept that People don't they, don't, they don't expect being perfect, they expect being awesome. And the way you become awesome is by providing value, being passionate about what you do, and really care about, caring about people. All right, thanks. Um, Dave, Jen, you wanna take over? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Roberto, are you, gonna be, are, are you gonna be here for a second? Are you gonna be here for a second so we can ask you another question? Can I ask you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay, so yeah, the question I had is, and thank you, by the way, this was absolutely great, and thank God I, I know how to do shorthand, because I think other people are gonna have to listen, in, but I love it. Um, I love that you get talking like that, I do that a lot too. Um, one of the questions I had is, and Robert, you know this from having a coaching session with me, right, is bridging this gap between this activity and getting results, right? Right. And, um, in your, your second point, you had mentioned about the structure and framing and making sure, and I love yeah. this phrase, which is um, the message starts when the video ends. So yeah. what are some things that you could give us? What kind of, what kind of um, I hate the word scripting, but some, some catchphrases, some phraseology that we could use to bridge the gap to encourage um, that call to action. What are some of the things that you would recommend to us? So what, 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 I, uh, what I really recommend is that when I look back of my videos or my presentations, what works best for me is not much about the close, about how, how I'll build up the problem in the end. I'm sorry, how I'll build up the problem during my video, yes? Okay. Because if you don't build up the problem well enough in the middle of the video, I can have uh, this amazing call to action um, that, but if they don't feel that they have a problem, they're not gonna do anything about it. Yeah, so unfortunately, I feel like it's a, well, the call to action could be, it's, it's just to be super specific, depends on what you're trying to do a call to action for. What I do personally, I like to do a call to action, be super specific, so here's or whatever, if I'm doing a call, to, uh, uh, call to action to sign up for something online, or to call me or email me, whatever, then I always 
in influence, we have the law of primacy and recency, what's come first and last, right? So people have a tendency to, that's why I like to open up strong, finish up strong. So I do a call to action once, then I come up with a little quote or a little saying or a power line, something to elevate the emotion again or analogy. Could it be something like, look, let me ask you something. Who do you think gets results? The person who thinks about going to the gym or the guy who goes, lifts, and runs? The, 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 the guy who takes action, right? So that's why, listen to this video on Change Your Life. Calm you change your life, right? So, so I do something along the lines of like maybe a little analogy in the end and I close again. So personally, I like to do, I have one call to action, then I have either a quote or analogy, or maybe like if I, if I can fit in like 20 second story, and then I do another call to action. Okay. And then my videos end, and depends, and then, and then if you wanna put like a, something in the end of a video with, uh, in addition to, because I saw some videos, and some people, they, they just put their contact information without a call to action. So should be, you should have fun, and, 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 and do, I do twice, so that's answering your question. I'll do twice. Once, mm -hmm. then I come up with something I call high note, to leave them a high note, with a quick story, uh, uh, analogy or quote, and I close again. Yep. Yeah, this actually gets down to the old, the old way, and it's still a way that I, I do it, of uh, presenting, is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then mm -hmm. tell them what you told them. Yep. So that sort of identifies that high and low uh, note that you're mentioning, you know, about that as well. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Michelle, um, is there anything you'd like to ask? No. Uh, well, um, I love everything about it. I actually had the pleasure of seeing you um, at one of our RPM events, So you and you're incredible. Your energy level on stage is like, <laughs> I'm tired when I get done seeing you, which is great. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love that, for me, I think when I do my videos, because I do, I still criticize myself to death, is taking that energy level up like one or two ticks when I'm doing the video to make it a little bit more animated. I, I feel sometimes I'm not as animated on my videos as I am in person. So let me tell you, let me give a, a, a pointer here. The average presenter describes without feeling the influencer feels before describing. Which oh, means I love that. that. Which means that when I when I prepare my content, right? So today I actually woke up and I wrote this, kind of just outline, so do a presentation here for you guys. Anything that I'm not feeling it, I ask my I always ask myself, like, am I feeling this? If I say no, I'm not feeling it. And I just throw away. I don't I don't talk about it. So for me, I always like to it's almost like this is a mental framework that I personally have where right before my information I'm trying to feel. Because from and, and it's not again, it's not to be to change your style of delivery. And I think Robert said a great point. Everybody has the different styles. For me, for example, because I'm I'm more like high energy, I had to learn and I'm still learning to drop my energy a little bit so other people can relate. So that's my air of improvement. So, so I don't, so I, I, I am always conscious about, man, you're going too high, go, slow down, slow down. Especially with the accents, not good, right? Because too much, too fast, not good. Now, some people, though, they have to become aware of going up a little bit. And what I found in video, when it comes to, you want to be 100% authentic, but video takes like maybe, I don't know, 3 4% of the energy. So it's okay, if, and sometimes like in front of a camera and just freeze there, and feel awkward. So try to just like feel a little bit and let it go. But just like, am I feeling this content? And, it, it, and try to feel and play that little movie in your mind before you go in. So that's what I do to, to have more, a little bit more emotion, a little more animation in your videos. In the beginning, even like one exercise that I, that I teach people is just the beginning, by the way, you don't have to do this in a live video, but you can train. Just do it for a practice. Try to exaggerate first, right? You don't have to publish the video. When you record a video, exaggerate, like, you know, gestures, and then play <laughs> back and be like, man, it's too much. Then you, you find the, the right balance to you. But a lot, a lot of us, sometimes we don't, we don't allow ourselves to be expressive. And here's a lesson that I learned. You, have, you can have someone, they're like, 
right be, they're, they're, let's say they are going to record a video. Right before they're sharing something that happens during the weekend with their buddies. And they're super animated, having fun, smiling, right? They're like, they're talking one on one. And then you get the same person who was super animated. You bring that person back in front of a camera, freezes. Where is the animation? Where is that energy? Oh, because it has to be business like. Well, I, you know, from, I realized that it's okay to have fun, right? Obviously, context is important, but it's, people wanna, if, if you're not having fun there, I'm telling you, the listener's not gonna have fun too. So I feel like um, try, try, try to be able to be expressive. So that's that's one tip that I have. Yeah, and I you know, and I also think that um, you know, passion is um, passion's very contagious. I think that that motivates people and that you know enlightens people. And so I I think if you know we can be very passionate when we're doing when we're doing that, even if it borders the line of um, the concern about being professional, I think that would override. Yes. I'll tell you this study. I, lo I love I love it, uh, I love what you just said. There's a study. I usually I don't I don't memorize I didn't memorize that study, but it's a study done in Orange County, and uh, with uh, 64 uh, angels investors. Basically, an angel investor. If you have a startup and you need money, and you go to a a pitch, and they had 64 angel angels investors who write checks. So they in this group in Orange County. And they invest, have, they have invested millions of dollars. And this psychologist wants to prove the, to see if passion of the speaker influence the investor to write a check. So right after they invest the money, they had a questionnaire. Okay, why you invest in this portion? The number one thing was the the idea. The idea gotta be good. All right. Number two, the strength of the entrepreneur. Now, number three was passion. Check this out. Passion, passion ranked higher than education, if the guy went to Harvard or not, than startup experience and age. It was crazy because the investors trying to get money to start up and passion ranked higher than if the guy had the previous startup experience, which is insane. So I agree with you that passion plays a, a critical role in communication. So. That's great. That's great. So listen, we want to kind of open this up to our audience, and I know we're, we're close on your time because you, you have to run as well. It's uh, 39 past, but if anyone has any questions, go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll be able I'll unmute you and make sure that you um, can ask a direct question. Otherwise, Robert, is there anything, while we're waiting for a few questions, or hands to be raised, is there anything that you'd like to um, add to what Roberto has said? I just want to springboard and amplify what he said about being real in your communication. And um, in, in writing, I've got a lot of it, and there's guys that are just fluid. Like you said, they're, they're animated, they're fluid, they're articulate, and they go to write, like an email or that. And one of the big things I've, I've had to do with people is mess it up a bit. It's too professional to communicate. And it, <laughs> and it, it doesn't sound like, a, you know, all of a sudden they turn into a, you know, dear so-and-so, I am writing to inform you that on the such-and-such -such day, and it's this formal communication and it loses all of that passion and energy. So what he, what Roberto is saying doesn't just apply to your videos. It applies to everything you're writing mm -hmm. and, and doing and letting that shine through all of your communications. So that, that's a fundamental point. I just wanted to um, make sure they can take what he just said and amplify it through all of their, their goodies that they're doing. Love it. Yeah, thank you notes and, and things like that too. I mean, I think that's part yes. of all of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Roberto, we'll let you go. There aren't any questions right now. I think everyone uh, has been, their hands hurt from writing notes, <laughs> well, <laughs> which is great. Thank you so much. And I hope thank you guys you. have any questions. My email is roberto at influenceology.com. Is roberto at influenceology. Have any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We we uh, really really appreciate, it. and I'm sure we'll have you on again to teach us even more as we grow. Uh, Thank you. We gotta stay calm. Bye bye. All right. Thank you, Roberto. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Robert, so so what would you like to add to any of this? Because I, I know you'd like to, you know, perhaps stay on the call, and and if not, that's certainly fine. Um, we have a couple of topics that we want to talk about. And actually, let me let me just um, before you before you answer that. 
Um, one of the specific topics that we had have is a result of a poll that I had asked about a few um, a few weeks ago. But I'd like to hear what you have to say first, and then I would like to ask you this question from the poll as well, because I feel that um, your contribution would be really, really helpful for us. All right. Um, let me jump on. So, hi. Hi there. What I ask everybody to do, if we have, have like a moment of air silence here, is he just dropped seven things on you and a lot of advice. I would love everybody listening to write down one actionable thing they're going to do based on his talk. Yep. Because it's it's so easy to let that go, and you know you're a coach, and you know um, how easy it is for them. Um, they've just been handed this treasure, and then they just okay, I'm going to come back and look at that. I'll review my notes. I'll do this. So I I would ask the people if the, if they can respond back. Um, as Roberto talked, and as you heard him over the 20 minutes. What's one insight that really stood out to you? What, what's a message um, that as you were listening, you're going like, oh, that's the message, or, or that's what I want to do, or oh, that's what I want to improve. So I would throw out to the questions, and, and Jen, you can see if anybody responds there. Go ahead and put in, what, what's the big aha they got listening to Roberto today? And then the, yeah. the follow-up to that is, what action are they going to take? Yeah, perfect. And I just I just posted that on our on our um, Facebook page as well, so that everyone can answer the questions back. Because I think people receive things differently. You know, I I definitely you know have all my notes, and then I had my takeaways, you know, put on the side. And you know, so I'll I'll answer that question now. Um, for me, um, I mean, among all the things that we learned, right? Um, right. One of the things that I do is um, I have a um, nine step process that I use after meeting with a referral partner because you know how we I don't want it to be a one and done I want it to be a one and one and keep growing and um, so I have this 90 day process that I use and follow with okay and in that process I have send a success story okay via email well right. I just changed it to change my success story email to a success story video excellent so that's the first thing that I'm going to do is change those. I've got four or five different success stories, and they're very specific. They're for first-time home buyers. They're for um, you know people who are credit challenged. And I'm trying to you know, and I decide which video I'm going to, or which email I'm going to send to this um, this person that I am um, you know trying to create a relationship with. And now I'm just going to select the specific video. So I'm really excited about implementing um, all of his suggestions to create that one simple thing and make that change. So I just want to share that. Michelle, what about you? What do you think you're going to do to implement as a result of today? Okay, don't laugh because, you know, I, I always make the funny comments. Is I'm going to pretend when I get on my video that I'm going on my first date because I tend <laughs> to be a little bit more excited. <laughs> but it will help me. It will help me get, put me in the frame, the frame of, oh, my gosh, you know, that little bit of excitement because sometimes I get a little, you know, our business can our business is exciting to me, but to the average Joe, it's not. So I need to somehow portray that energy that I have into a video and not be bland. So I'm going to try to think about it being a first date right before I get it, so I can put a smile on my face before I start the video. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I love that. And um, so Lisa Kelly um, commented here just a second ago, and she said, um, you know, to be more persuasive with her call to action. That's something that she's going to work right. on. Um, Brad said a call to action was being missed on my videos. He said that as well. Um, practice, practice, practice. Uh, I will um, be doing videos and trying to have a have great energy. And that was from um, um, I, gosh, I can't read this thing very well. Uh, Sasari, Sasari Jackson. I'm sorry if I pronounced that in wrong. Um, don't expect to be perfect. Expect to be right. awesome. <laughs> I love that. The way to be awesome is to add value and help fam families. Um, someone else said, uh, Tina said, bring that one-on-one -on -one feeling to my videos, as if you're talking to that one person. You know, I absolutely love that as well. Um, and the, uh, someone else just said, uh, and I'll find the name here in just a second, just do it. Doing it will make you feel better. I also love the idea to make a video that, um, and I do like this too, a video of the should ask questions. We don't really do that, right? We do, we sort of, and I know I've done this in the past is, okay, frequently asked questions. I can't think of anything today, so I'll go online and Google some frequently asked questions. But the bottom line is, as lenders, we're asked questions all the time that are the same questions, right? Yeah, I think in the video contest, Rich did something on, here's what you should be asking. 
Yeah. Oh, that's right. He did because I listened yeah, to that one. Great, yeah. He did a great job on that one. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think I think that's really um, really great that everyone's got this call to action. So you know, keep them coming because these you know we may have missed I may have missed something that. Yeah, that's right. I want to do that that one part as well. So I want to talk about that one to one part that he talked about. Like, imagine you're talking to one person. So yeah. little, little story. So I've done all this copy research, and what one of the greatest copywriters, advertising writers of all time. Um, he uh, he was active during like 1915 till uh, the 1930. I don't know what happened. Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Yeah. Technology. Yeah. So, anyway, this this guy was paid in, in 1920s dollars, two million dollars. He was the highest paid writer of the English language period across all things. He had a crisis moment early in his career um, where he couldn't write anymore. He couldn't communicate. He'd sit down and it was just a dry well. And so at four in the morning, he was, he was working in his office till four in the morning, he wrote a letter of resignation to his boss. He went in, left it on the, the desk, went out and walked around New York City, came back, packed up his stuff to leave, and goes, I'm going to read the letter one more time. And he sits and he reads the letter, and he's like, man, that is good. Why is that letter so good? And he goes, I was talking to one person, my boss. And then he, he, he had that, it was like the light went off, and it's like, oh. And so from then on, for the rest of his career, he would think of, he, he was actually writing for Saks Fifth Avenue in the 20s, he would think of one woman or one wealthy man that he was writing to, and he would write his ads like that, and it completely transformed his ad writing and the results, and they were just crazy what people would do. Um, uh, an, another copywriter, he kind of ran into the same thing, and his was, you know what, when I was a kid around the farmhouse, the mail would come, and it was a big idea, or it was a big thing when the mail would come, we would all look at the letters, and he goes, I would imagine my family reading one of those letters. Is the, and he goes, and that's how I got through that. So I just want to emphasize as people, um, you kind of do this general communication or video out there. What Roberto said was real important is think about talking to just one person, one on one. You know, hey Susie, and have a conversation with them. Think about a past client that you've talked with and communicate that same thing one on one, just like you're talking to them. It, yeah. It'll dramatically alter the tone, the flavor. It gets rid of that professional yuckiness and and stuff in the in the communication. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I mean, even with my video, I, I, I can't remember because I'd have to go back and listen to it. It was, um, and I was listening to you critique me, and I was going, be a big girl, be a big girl, oh. all good. <laughs> you know, all of us I have. That. And, uh, yeah, I know, it's, it, it just happens. But uh, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I believe I said in my video, but I know a lot of, every, a lot of people did, is they said, hey, everybody, I want to talk to you about a total cost analysis, right? They said, everybody. Rather than, hi, it's Jen. I'd like to talk to you about the purpose of or the reason behind it, you know, total cost or, or whatever. And, and I think that, um, I know I find that really hard because I'm not going to use Susie if I'm trying to get this big right. video out to everybody. Now, of course, if I'm going to do one, yeah, I'm going to use that one individual. And I think, um, you know, so you bring a really good point to make sure that we're um, talking in that singular person. Well, and um, you just said the, ma the magic word, which is you. Um, yeah. when, when I write, I go, you, because mm -hmm. the letters go into one person or the, the videos go into one person. So uh, really, that's the magic word that you just gave. That if, and if people just go, here's what you need to know about getting a loan, it's going to dramatically, it's going to create that one-to-oneness. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, okay, so... Um... Let's. I, what I wanted to talk about, and I, and I really, again, everybody listening in, like we've got 57 people on here. If you, um, if you'd like to raise your hand, please raise your hand, and hopefully um, the staff members as well are. Um, it looks like Tina has a question. Uh, Tina, I'm going to unmute you, so that you can um, can ask a question. Um, and I don't know. I, I know you're not raising your hand, but do you have any questions or any comments about what you've heard today that you'd like to share with us? If I can get her to unmute, you have to unmute yourself, by the way. She hasn't. Okay, I'm taking. I don't have any questions. 
You don't. Okay. All right. Thanks. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, okay. So what I wanted to do then is, can we can we go back to the poll that I had done um, a couple weeks ago uh, for um, our meeting? I mean, for this call. And one of the things that that, and I'm trying to reach it here because I want to make sure that everybody knows what this poll was. That I had said, you know, our insane productivity is coming up this Friday. What we'd like to talk about. And of course, last week we had a speaker. But the poll was, um, the winner of the poll was what we're going to be doing next year. Stop starting and keeping. You know, ideas on what everyone's thinking about doing for business and marketing plans next year. And, and you know, this stop, start, and keep is something that I do every year when I'm doing my, working on my business plan, which is, you know, what will I stop doing that's not working? What am I going to start doing that perhaps was on my um uh, I call it a parking lot. I just put things on my parking lot so that I don't succumb to the shiny object syndrome all year long. Right. Right? So I put it in my parking lot and I revisit my parking lot at the end of the year as I'm going to be doing. And then um, the start, stop, and then what am I going to keep? What am I going to do? And of course, I'm going to enhance that. Do you have any insight on, you know, I know you've been talking to a lot of loan officers recently on, on what kind of patterns you're seeing with, um, Suggestions about what to stop doing that's just an overall pattern, uh, an item that is becoming um, a real big controversy for loan officers to be able to get over that hump and move on and, and really yeah, I, I, I'll speak generally. There's a, um, okay. Peter Drucker said, um, starve failure, feed success. And a common thing I see just not with the loan officers, but in businesses, and maybe we'll use, if we look at something outside of our industry, it's easier to see. Mm -hmm. And I, I was talking with a loan company, and they're a SaaS uh, software is um, was a software service company in the financial planning industry. And we were talking about where their business was coming from, and we were focused on one area that was a red, you know, it was a smash thumb, it was throbbing, and so that's what all their attention was on. After we were done talking with that, I kind of stood back and and I tried not to do this up front more, but um, for whatever reason I didn't. I stood back and I go, you know, big picture, where does your revenue come from? And they're like, oh, well, you know, X comes from this and X comes from this. And anyway, 50% of the revenue came from um, corporate sales, not individual sales, so individual financial planners. And I'm like, okay. I go, well, um, who do you have selling that or who's doing it or how are you approaching it? And they go, we're not. And I'm like, what? <laughs> right. They go, um, no, he goes, oh, I don't have any time. I, I, I go, where do those deals come from? They go, oh, they just call us. And so and you I'm beat like, your head against the wall on, on something. The, yeah. Yes. And yeah. so they're just beating it on the wall. And, and I'm like, oh, my word, dude, if you're getting 50% of a revenue, you know, the 80-20, so you're getting 50% of your revenue from an area you're putting zero effort or time in. What is that telling you? What's the universe communicating to you about what to do? I had to hammer that CEO for six months before they finally got someone attached. Now 90% of the revenue comes from the area. They've completely dumped all the problem area um, because it was huge. It was overhead. You had telemarketers. You had sales staff. You had support, right? All of that's gone, and they're dealing – you know, they're selling 300C licenses. Yeah. Or, yeah, Michelle, get ready because I'm going to ask you this question too. But I was going to, I was going to um, reflect on that. You know, as a as a coach, I'm having um, not having any problems. Um, as a coach, I find that a lot of people have difficulty deleting people from their database. Right. And that and you're, and I, I know you're talking to that specifically because it's that thought of, well, but maybe one day they might work with me, maybe, and you know, we hold on to those things, and it sounds like that's what the CEO is doing, and I, I think in our industry, a lot of people do that. We hold on to um, the idea that, and I'll use an example, the idea that working with builders is where it's at, because I saw Joe Blow work with builders, and so I'm going to hold on to that idea, even though it's not working for me or holding on to working with um, people that continue to give you bad credit scenarios, right? Um, and so I think it's just human nature that we, that we do that. Um, it, but I do think that the importance here is that tracking, and this is something that Darren talks about a lot too, is that we've got to measure um, what we're doing so that we can identify that. If we're not even measuring it, 
then thank goodness the CEO was measuring, right? So right. it really starts with measuring and knowing where your business comes from to be able to um, to rectify that and move it along. I mean, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um, the simplest tool on planet Earth is the 80-20 analysis. If you want to be a marketing genius or strategy guy like me, you just use 80-20 and you're a genius when you walk in. You ask a couple questions, go, hey, why not over here? And and there's the answer, right? It's, it's, right. it's like the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it's hard to do with ourselves. So um, I, I, I was working with a financial planner and um, we're trying to find more referrals and, and grow his business. And so it was like, well, I mean, he had 150 clients. And I go, well, let's create some criteria. What's your ideal client? And, and one of the criteria was he actually liked working with them. And the second one is, how many people do they refer to me? And this is and, he, and so he, he made a spread. He's a financial planner. He makes a spreadsheet with all of his clients, and he had you know the five or six criteria, including these, do I like working with them? Um, oh, how, how much revenue are they worth to my practice? You know, assets under management stuff. And, um, and so he had that. And what it came down to is all of his top people magically were entrepreneurs. But mm. on the referral part of it, that's also where his referrals came from. Here is the surprise. When he actually stopped and thought about, well, they're coming from these entrepreneurial clients, he went, it's coming from their wives. <laughs> Interesting. Because all my word, it's these entrepreneurs' wives right. that are referring me because why? Because they're talking with other entrepreneurial wives that go on, my husband's driving me nuts, our income's up and down, he spends as much as we make, right? Um, we're not making money, but we're giving it to our employees so we can meet payroll. The wives were feeling the emotional pain from their husband's entrepreneurial adventure, right? And, um, and, it, and so it tended to be the wives that referred him in um, that. And so he started doing luncheons and things. With the wives, so right. Right. But that's, but that's awesome. another classic thing of if you actually sit down um, on your clients and go, mm -hmm. what clients did I just love working with? What clients have referred me the most? And take a look. You know, some of you only have 20. You're just starting out. Some of you got a 200, 300 to look at. And you kind of go through it and you'll see these patterns emerge and they're just like amazing. I call them leverage, right? Yeah. Um, sure. It's like that's what's naturally occurring. Do more of that and do less of the stuff that isn't. The thing that you're fighting against, like running up, you know, uphill, you know, in sand and the snow, and I mean, all those crazy things. We're we're just killing ourselves to do it. So, Michelle, so Michelle, what what is it, you know, since we're talking about sort of this this idea of giving up things that aren't working and focusing and, and shining a light more on the things that are working? What what have you experienced? Because you had a lot of breakthroughs, you know, in your practice. Is you know, you're now doing you know, 95, 100 million a year. What, what are some of the things that you realized that you had to um, give up or focus on? Hopefully she's coming back. I don't know where she's at. Yeah, I think everybody can write on their give up list, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. Actually, Michelle, you have to, um, you have to unmute yourself there. But, um, you know, I was going to say something. Somebody, somebody had taught me something, um, and I use it quite a bit when I'm explaining this, this concept that you're talking about here, is that if you think of a ladder, okay, a ladder, and it has, you know, the rungs on the top, and then it has the little steps and everything, um, and, and you think of that in, in the framework of the lowest ladder is you funding $500,000 a month, and then you go to a million and a million five, and the top of the ladder is you closing, you know, 10, 5, 10, 15 million a month, whatever your number is, or, or look at it as, you know, the number of families that you're helping every month. You cannot get to the top rung without letting go of the lower rung, right? Right. And sometimes you get to the top rung and you actually realize, and in the case of this CEO, this is a good example because he was doing well, you find that you're leaning against the wrong wall. Sometimes that happens too. And so when we're climbing these ladders, we have to always remember that sometimes we're going to have to give up things on the lower rungs to get to the next level. And sometimes, and this also relates uh, to teams as well, the people that got you to 500 or 2 million, let's just say 2 million a month in fundings may not be the same team members or staff members that you have on your team that will get you to the higher levels, right? right. And so I think if we, you know, I, I think about a monkey trying to, you know, this is what we look like. We look like monkeys on a ladder, you know, um, trying to hang on on one end and one on the other end and we're, and we're stressed out and we can't we can't seem to get to our goals and so I think if, if we can kind of look at it that way is saying you know what am I going to stop doing what am I going to keep doing to go forward and what do I need to start doing to get to that higher you know echelon of the ladder 
Right. Well, no, exactly. There's a, a, a phrase I use because I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, which means a lot of them, when they got started, they hire their friends and family. Yeah. Friends and family are not always the best, the most skilled, the best employee. And so what I started seeing was this pattern and um, an entrepreneur has these visions, but in his balloon floats up, right? But it's chained to the, to the lowest employee. Yeah. And there is no way they can break until they cut the chain. Yep. And then their business will take off. But I, I go, so these entrepreneurs are chaining these multi-million dollar businesses to the performance of the least performing employee. Yep. And, they've got to, and it's hard because a lot of times that person's loyal. Um, they, that person stuck with them through ups and downs in the start and that. But the fact is that person, especially if they're in a key, for example, marketing role, finance role, something like that. They're, they're, that business can't get past that person, and it's a hard message. There's just yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. But, and sometimes well, that's us. I, I'm sorry. Oh, and sometimes that's us. Like yeah. me, oh yeah, yeah, we're you know, uh, technology. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna modify my website, right? No, stop that. I'm the weakest link. Right. Sometimes that's the case. That's right. Well, listen, we're at the top of the hour. I hope everyone has enjoyed um, today. You know, um, it, please go ahead and, uh, you know, comment on our Facebook page. You know, let us know what you're going to be doing. We'd like to hear what you're doing. And um, Robert, we want to thank you for joining us today as well. And we'll catch you all next week. Take care. Have a great week. Thanks, Jen.